Um, thanks again for having me here. Super honored to be here. Um, what I'm gonna try and do is talk a little bit about um, how we can use imaging to empower our understanding of um, rivers and shores. And I realized, you know, as I was looking at the presentation I could give and some of the examples I could give about Puget Sound and the work I'm doing in Puget Sound that um, I don't have a lot of um, North Sound mapped. And I do have some areas um, that uh, of rivers in the North Sound that, that I can go over. So I, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through this presentation real quick, talk about where the ideas came from to do this, and then um, show you some examples of the application in some of the rivers up north, as well as um, then going to Puget Sound and showing, uh, talking a little bit about the work that I'm doing there. So, um, you know, over 100 years ago, these guys, man, the, the most advanced tech of the time was these cameras and they had to, you know, this is the USGS guy hauling the camera out into the field. Um, you know, it took days to get there, um, days to return, you know, a long time to develop these images. Um, and, uh, but, you know, that was the most advanced tech they had at the time. And, and, and from that, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have, you know, this, these type of images, these portals into what conditions were like over 100 years ago. You know, you can go to the University of Washington Digital Library and look up all these old pictures. It's pretty incredible. This is a picture of Deception Pass um, from about 120 years ago, I think. So, you know, super, super cool um, that we have that today, right? So <laughs> the most advanced technology for imaging today is, you know, thanks to Google was this idea of, you know, totally creating this immersive view of um, areas. And, uh, you know, they strapped a bunch of cameras in, on top of the car and drive around and, and um, we get these, these street view uh, maps that, that, that they and others made. But the problem with those maps for, you know, for 99.9% .9 of the areas is that you can't take, if you're familiar, the little, grab the little peg guy, drop it on the map, go on the street. You can't do that with the water, right? So um, that was a problem that I recognized as I was working as a fishery biologist and um, thought that it needed to be solved. And I was ready to kind of move on in my career and try something different. So um, I contacted some friends who were smarter than me and we got together and, you know, tried to become uh, a Google for the waterways, essentially. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, being a scientist, I wanted it to mean more than just street views, right? So um, I wanted to be able to incorporate data. So when we would go out on the water, we would collect as much information as possible. And I wanted to have ways for um, users to be able to explore that data in context of the imagery. Um, and also in terms of the mapping part of this part of it, you know, we, we got in touch with Esri and they invited this into their startup program. And so we became partners with Esri. And so we have this mapping capability that gives us, you know, the full stack of Esri's um, technology as well. So, you know, but also I wanted it to be free, right? I wanted to have an Atlas where everyone could go and see these areas because not just for science and conservation is this an important tool, but also um, I believe that, you know, if, if everyone in the general public were able to access these waterways virtually and experience them, maybe that they would um, feel more inclined to protect them. And it's been proven out through lots of different research um, that, you know, pictures matter, right? Um, this quote here that humans have a remarkable ability to remember pictures, um, 2,000 pictures with at least 90% accuracy were recognized after several days. Um, this is, you know, a, a, from a research paper in the National Academy of Sciences. It's, there's a lot of research that have been done on how pictures impact and stick with us. So here is what we did. We, you know, this is this is where we're at today. Um, this is me out on Puget Sound mapping um, the near shore in the Nisqually, Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually Wildlife Refuge. 
Um, but essentially what we have is, is a camera on top. Um, we In the past, we had to build our own cameras, but recently uh, some of the off the shelf cameras have come our way and are doing just a great job. So this is a GoPro Max on top of the kayak. Um, so what water quality meter in the water and um, every 10 seconds, the camera goes off. Every 10 seconds, the water quality meter logs, a water quality measurement, and we put all that together. So why is this important? You know, um, my hope is that, you know, like if, I like to think about it this way. If, if you're in the Louvre in Paris and you're looking at a Van Gogh, you know, and you're standing back, you get to see the big picture and the beauty of what he's trying to bring to the canvas. But when you're actually there, you also, you know, unlike when you're looking at a print, you also get to walk up to it and see the details, this more granular view of the brush strokes and, and really get a feel of, you know, what this area right here in the painting looks like. Um, so I'm going to try and pop out of this uh, presentation view and just show you some of what the application looks like and how it works. So if you go to our website, you can click on this atlas at the website. And here's an atlas of all the waterways that we've mapped around the country. Um, 5,000 miles of waterways all around the country, including um, a few thousand, a couple thousand in Africa with the National Geographic Okavango Wilderness Project. Um, so here in the Pacific Northwest, um, if you zoom in, you can go up to an area that's familiar with you guys. Um, and I'll take a look at some mapping we did in the Skagit River um, and talk to you about just kind of the basics of how the application works. So over here, you have a 360 image. And over here, you have an ArcGIS Online mapping application. Um, as you can see, you can look around just like you would with a street view. And you can click down, click down the river. Um, or you can go on the map and hover over the map and find areas that you want to see and click on the blue line on the map and go to that spot. Um, there's a few, to, a few tools that are, that are pretty cool that can, can be used. Um, you know, one tool is this tagging feature. So if you, if you see images, if you see points of interest in the imagery, um, you can, you can add a tag by clicking here, add it into the imagery, or you can also view tags. And in this case, some tags have already been added. Um, that show different areas. If you watch the red icon, it takes you to the place on the map where the tag is. And then you can go to that spot by clicking on the scene. So here's the tag that talks about these, uh, this buffering that took place to keep erosion from getting to the road and how it functions. And you can explore that, you know, just Clicking around, zooming in. Another um, river up north that we mapped a little bit of is the uh, Stillaguamish. And we worked with the Stillaguamish Watershed Council and the Stillaguamish tribe to map this river. And one of the things that they were excited about was um, showing some of the features of the river that they had data for in terms of feature layer services. So for example, you can look at some of the cold temp inflows that they had mapped previously to measure the differences between seeps that were coming into the river and the median water temperature. And the bigger circles have bigger differences and the smaller circles have smaller differences. And you can click on that and get the information from a pop-up, you know, and then you can go to that area where, where the spring is and, and see it. 
another um, feature that they were interested in looking at was these engineered log jams. Um, they had put a bunch of structures in the river and wanted to see how they were functioning and wanted to be able to show folks how they were functioning. People who can't get on the river, not very many people get to float down the river all the time. So this was an opportunity, right, to um, demonstrate how those how those log jams, engineered log jams were functioning. And, you know, here it is from the aerial view. And if you click on that spot on the map, it takes you to the log jam and you can see how it's capturing wood and building a gravel bar behind it and, and how it's functioning in general. So that's super cool. Um, also, in addition, we take, you know, a lot of different parameters with water quality and in turbidity measurements in this case. And there's this metadata table that shows all those different parameters. So as you click down the river, the data in the table changes. So you can, with each scene, you have a, a different set of data. Another, um, you know, with, with more focus on riparian uh, areas. This is some work that King County was doing, Channel Migration Zone study, and they had asked us to go map the Snoqualmie River. Um, and I wanted to look at this, this map in particular, because, you know, it shows some of the areas where the bank is eroding. And um, also, one of, one of the really cool, insightful things that they were able to pull out from the data was, we have a charting feature here that shows all the different parameters that we collect when we're out there. And um, in this case, we collected depth measurements. So hold on one second, I'm gonna refresh this. What it'll show you is, um, it'll show you the depth measurements for this area of the blue line, right? So this, this survey track, here is the survey miles on the x-axis and the depth on the y-axis. And the deeper the area, the higher the peak. So if you watch the red icon, when you hover over this line, it shows you where you're at on the river. And then you can start to go, you can click on the, the chart and it'll take you to those spots in the river where these anomalies are. And what they were noticing is that with each time you go to one of these super deep spots, and it's you know it's logical, but each time you go to one of these deep spots, it's associated with some kind of um, armoring structure over and over, <laughs> which you know is is interesting information that you would think intuitively, but it's great to be able to just have that at your fingertips and be able to explore it in more detail. So, you know, those, those are some of the bells and whistles of the application and, and how we try to incorporate data with, with the imagery. Um, and so, you know, what we do is, you know, we, we go out and get this information with folks in partnerships, but also, you know, there are areas that um, I have felt that just need to happen that haven't been happening and in terms of mapping with this technology and, and didn't seem like there was any any time that it was going to happen, you know. So, so when I when I when I see those areas, I take the initiative, and we just said, "Hey, let's go map these because they just need to they need to be mapped." Um, and that area for us right now, for me, is is Puget Sound, right? Twelve hundred miles of Puget Sound um, near shore, approximately, and we're going to take that on. Um, so far. We've mapped um, from Seattle, a little bit past Olympia, about 300 miles of near shore so far. And so some of the advantages of having this more granular view of the Puget Down Sound north, near shore, excuse me, is that, you know, here, um, if you, I don't know if you're familiar with it, most of you probably are, is the Department of Ecology shore viewer, um, shoreline viewer, the last, bit of imagery they took was in 2016. Um, and this is an area here 
near Lincoln Park near Seattle, right? And if you click on that area and you zoom in on it, this is the information that you're going to get from that image. And you can see there looks like it's a, uh, a seawall here in Lincoln Park. Um, and this is the same area from our Puget Sound mapping project. So here, of course, you're just going to get um, a near shore water level view um, that's going to give you a lot more information about the condition of the seawall and um, what type of seawall it is and things like that. So, you know, that's that's one of the advantage of, advantages of this project. Another thing that I'm doing in this project is, as I, this is a typical shoreline of, you know, suburban um, King County area that I've encountered. But as I was saying, another um, thing that I'm doing is, so as you know, as we go down, we're taking water quality measurements and also I'm counting the birds and other animals that I see and I'm geotagging them with a, a voice recorder it geotags my voice memos. So if I'm paddling along and I see a great blue heron, I say, make a note, one great blue heron. And so you can look at all those animal counts in layers. Um, here's all the porpoises. There's a seal mortality that I saw and, and there's the seals, bald eagles. And as you start to click on them, you get to see some patterns that emerge about where the different animals sightings are, right? And one of the things that popped out to me when I was doing this is that there's this desert area here um, where I didn't count any animals and it wasn't because I was being lazy, right? You know, <laughs> um, they just weren't there. And um, when you click there and you get transported to that spot, it's, it's an area um, that's next to the railroad. Let's see if we can get a good view of it. Yeah, here, this is typical of that stretch. The railroad's up here um, and it's just this long stretch of Puget Sound butting up against bank armoring without beach. Um, so that could be an in indication of why some of the animal counts weren't as prevalent there because of maybe the lack of habitat. Um, and finally, one other thing that we can look at is, you know, in terms of patterns is how does some of the water quality data that we're collecting um, impact, you know, where, like show us what, what different activities are taking place in terms of land use in the riparian zone. Um, it's that land water interface, right? And what can we derive from the information that we're collecting? So in this case, um, if you use the charting feature and you look at pH, Here's the pH values um, for the entire 180 miles that we're seeing on the map right here. Um, and overall, I didn't collect water quality data in this stretch right here, but overall it's, it's hovering around seven. Um, but there is a, a little bit of an anomaly here where there's this dip and this caught my eye. So, you know, you can just click on that spot and get transported there. And um, you know, what I found was this area is adjacent to this gravel mine. And I'm not, I don't know that, um, <laughs> so you can see where the gravel offloads right there, um, where the barges come and pick it up. And here, as we zoom in on the map, you can start to see where the mining operation takes place. So I'm not, I'm not positive that that's why the pH dipped there, but it, it's it's something to look at. You know, um, it's a big body of water to potentially have had that capture. You know, you'd think that a lot of a lot of runoff would have to be coming in to change the pH there, but it's it's a way to look at large data sets and have contextual imagery to go with it. Um, and you know, I'm just going to wrap it up there. Um, happy to take questions. There are several questions that have come in. I'll just start at the top and go down. Um, one of them relates to the water quality that you were talking about uh, just a minute ago. 
wondering if at armoring locations there were any water quality parameters that were consistently different, such as temperature. Hmm, I haven't looked at temperature. Let's take a look. So, you know, it, there is some variability in temperature, and, and and one thing you'll notice if if you go, you know, if you go to the, the atlas on our website, um, and play around with this, you can take a look at some of those variables on your own. Um, but make sure if you see some of the peaks, make sure you click on them to see where they're coming from. Because what, what I didn't do is when I, I have to change the battery every two hours on the camera and I pull the kayak ashore and sometimes the water quality meter um, comes out of the water and it's still running. So you will see some peaks like that. Just click on them to make sure it's not, you know, it's not an anomaly from you um, coming out of the water. But no, I haven't done a look at the temperature from, from the bank armoring and whether there's increases there. And remember, I'm I'm in a so there's a reason I'm in a kayak. That might be a question. Um, why don't I do it faster and, and use a boat? Um, because I really want to be as close to the shore as possible, um, within 10 to 15 feet. So we have the most detailed image imagery that we can get. And that's that's not in a navigable zone, right? I'm I'm hitting stuff all the time with the kayak. Probably gonna hit something right here in this picture, you know. Um, so anyway. Um, is there a schedule of planned locations to map in the future? Yeah, so I was looking at the weather, man. It's clearing up this week, right? So I'm going to get back out there. <laughs> I'm totally pumped. Um, so I'm down here now in Totten Inlet, right here. And um, I'm in phase, this is what I'm calling phase two. Phase one took me to Olympia. Phase two wants to get to Shelton. Um, so I've got a week of mapping good mapping days coming up. So I'll be out on the water quite a bit. Um, the goal is to get the entirety of the Puget Sound all the way up, you know, to the North Sound, um, you know, up north of Woodby Island up here um, by early next summer. And in terms of timing, I just go when it's not too windy and not raining. You can't have rain on the camera it's really it's a difficult it's difficult to like you can't really do it by saying okay what's the tide level uh, of course if the tide's super far out i'm not going to get good imagery um close up to the to the shoreline the uh so i'm gonna wait it doesn't do us any good just to look at a, a big low tide um but for the most part uh i just go out when the weather is is right Um, WDFW habitat biologists used to promote the placement of rock groins to deepen the thalwig of streams and rivers when armoring was required to achieve uh, flood damage reduction. Um, I don't see a question in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not here to speak as to whether or not there was a benefit or a harm from the bank armoring. It was just an observation that was noted in that study they were doing. Um, I mean, that's the Snoqualmie River is in agriculture land. Clearly, I mean, that, that bank armor needs to protect farmland for sure, so. Mm -hmm. Have you mapped any systems multiple times? If so, is the user able to view multiple layers to compare changes to certain reaches or beaches over time? And that right, was a question that's, I had too. Do you, do you put time stamps and date stamps on your data? That's, yeah, the temporal aspect is huge, right? Um, super excited to get areas mapped as much as possible. And, and, you know, all the metadata is here. So the timestamp and the date is here. Um, we have mapped a few areas a couple of times. One of the first areas we mapped was, um, I mapped was the Elwha River 48 hours after the dams came down. So you can go to the Elwha River and see baseline conditions on the Elwha River right after the dam removal. And I keep telling myself, I'm gonna get back out there and do that. Um, but I haven't been able to, but I'm really excited to get out on the Elwha and do that again. Another way we're going to get temporal um, information is, for example, there's about seven people with cameras who are just kayakers who are going around Puget Sound right now, getting more information 
Um, it's not related to the, the Puget Sound mapping project that I'm working on, um, but it just is other data. And around the country, we've got over 30 people with cameras. So we're building this really um, robust crowdsourcing program. Uh, we're giving them to nonprofits like the Georgia River Network has mapped 700 miles of, of rivers in Georgia over the last year. And they're gonna go back out to some of those same places over the next year. So that's one way we're gonna start getting temporal information is by um, getting a lot of the crowd to help send this data to us, send this imagery data to us and getting us and us putting it on the map. Yeah, you've got some volunteers in the chat. <laughs> Excellent, let's, let's, let's connect. Similar to Bridget Moran's question, have you mapped water quality data multiple times? So that's the same question yeah. over several years. So um, one thing about the crowds, the crowd mapping program is it just collects imagery. Um, if, if you have a boat with a, a fish finder on it and you can get temperature data um, and depth data, that's good to send us as well. But um, the water quality meter that I use, I calibrate every day and you know, it's, it's a fairly technical piece of equipment that I wouldn't expect. Um, folks who aren't trained to use it to use, plus it's expensive. Here's kind of a related question. Somebody is wondering if you have worked with other agencies that are already doing surveys to kind of piggyback on this. Yeah, um, that's one. That's one. There's a, a agency in Texas uh, who monitors rivers, and they're doing some flood flood control work with some of our cameras. And every time they go out, they they turn them on. But yeah, we're all about like. I know there's every fall, right? Everyone gets on the rafts and does spawner surveys and super excited to get folks with WDFW cameras and have them just take imagery while they're out there doing spawner surveys. It sounds like you already have a plan for where you're headed next, but somebody's wondering if you take requests for locations. <laughs> Absolutely. Areas that you think need to be mapped, let's, let's talk about it and, and figure out how to get them. Um, here's a question like, again about going back to sites. Do you ever have to go back because there's blurry imagery or inconsistencies? You know, um, we take an image. I've had to go back because the camera failed. Um, but we take a picture every 10 seconds. So it's fairly robust in terms of the, the number of images we have. So if one of them is doesn't work, um, then then we have another one just a few feet away. But also one of the reasons we use a GoPro camera um, and we even, even when we first started, we used GoPro cameras. We glued them to a dinner plate and wired them all together back when we were first trying to figure out how to put the technology together. But um, GoPro cam cameras are super good at doing this kind of action type photography. Um, so they, they're really great at taking a good image every time, even when the light varies. Um, so we haven't had a lot of issues with them. How do you hope this technology can communicate fishery science and water quality to a broader audience like policymakers and the public? Um, reach is the main thing. Like, I don't know how many folks here that I presented to today knew about this, but our whole goal with particularly in, in doing the Puget Sound and going, oh my God, this crazy dude's going to kayak 1,200 miles on the near shore of Puget Sound is, is to get in the press, um, to get be able to get presentations like this to folks. Um, and the more folks who know about it, the, the better the opportunity for, um, for that to happen, right? For them to be able to access this data or to request data that they think is, is in need. Um, I think... Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, hopefully going to present to the Puget Sound Partnership and, and folks like that. I presented to the Puget Sound Near Group. Um, so yeah, just just the ability to get in front of as many people as possible. Talking, to, I've been presenting to schools. Um, yeah. And how much of the Skagit do you have finished? Just that little stretch that I showed you. Um, just this small little stretch, about ten miles. I'm excited to, the, to I'd love to do the entire schedule. Um, yeah, I would be excited for that too. You know, and to be honest, the schedule is kind of a big system. So if we're really concerned about having the most detailed imagery we can uh, of the land water connection there, like, you know, 
it may be valuable to go down both banks. We've done that in, in some systems. We did it on the Snoqualmie actually. Mm -hmm. How does your data tie in with the Coastal Atlas photographs that the state has? So we've, I've had a conversation with him a couple of times and that goes all the way up north into um, the Salish Sea up in uh, British Columbia. Um, I'd like to be able to tie into as many different map, photo mapping, data mapping um, organizations as possible. USGS has so many different maps that have so much data on them as well um, that, you know, where this, this imagery would, would be beneficial to be married to those, the data in those maps. How is your project funded? So it's funded in a couple of ways. Um, one way is just kind of straight up consulting. People hire us to go gather data for their needs, like the King County project we did. Um, and that's kind of a feast or famine. It's, you know, it's it's hit or miss. It's we're we're keeping our head above the water, just our nose barely, you know, from that perspective. And um, the other is we've decided that our conservation arm, which is not officially a 501c3, it's just something we, like the Puget Sound Project, something we just we just fund on our own. Um, we've decided that we would like to have a conservation arm that's officially a 501c3. And so I think in the next, within the next few months, we're gonna have, you know, earthuse.org, um, which is gonna allow us to potentially get grant type funding and, um, That'll be beneficial. Mm 